and welcome to the 2020 MBR Trail Bike of the Year test. This year we've split the test into two different categories and today we're going to take a look at all the shop bought bikes. Now as we do with every single model we review, all of these bikes here have been weighed and measured in our workshop. This means that you can accurately compare the geometry without having to rely on information supplied by the manufacturer. We've also measured the vertical rear wheel travel on each of the bikes and to create a level playing field to really allow us to focus on the performance and handling of each bike, we've fitted them all with control tyres. Now we've returned all of these bikes back to their original spec, but for the test we chose to run a Maxxis Minion DHF 2.5 up front for its blend of cornering grip and rolling speed. And on the back we chose to run the Maxxis Minion DHR2 for its climbing and braking traction. Because modern trail bikes are so capable, we chose to run the Exo Plus casing for extra puncture protection, and we chose an intermediate 3C Max Terra compound for its blend of speed and grip. So joining me is Alan Muldoon, our bike test editor. And I think before we get into the nitty gritty of the bikes and introduce them all, we should talk a little bit about how we categorize the trail bike for the purposes of this test. Yeah, totally. I mean, one of the key things with the, this test is that they're not enduro bikes. They're not short travel bikes. We kind of try to keep travel focused between 130 and 150 on the bikes. There are two categories to the test. We should make clear there's the shop bought bikes and then there's the sales direct. And why did we split up the, the test into shop bought and direct sales? And from last year's test, it was really clear that the sales direct brands had a massive advantage in terms of price. So even if we kind of like equated for price, the specification was way better. Mm. And like, if you've got a better fork, a better shock, better tires, you end up pretty much with a better bike. I'm kind of assuming that um, the guy that's looking at the sales direct brand kind of knows what they want. So they're looking at the geometry charts, they're looking at the travel, they kind of go like, they maybe had a few bikes already and they've gone like, that's definitely the bike that hits what I want. Um, and then the guy that wants to go shop bot, he's going there, he's going to get some advice, he's going to get some, he maybe wants to try it, he wants to sit on it, he wants to take it for a test ride, maybe more cautious in terms of his buying experience. And like, there are sweeping, huge sweeping generalizations, but the key thing was really was to kind of level the pricing. Hmm. and ultimately what you get for, you on, yeah. on, for that money. And what kind of price point are we looking at for all of these we're bikes? We're looking from three and a half to just over four thousand pounds. Okay. Yeah. And the last thing is obviously the 29er issue. Now, all of these are 29ers. Yeah. Last year we had a 27 and a half category. We don't have that this year. In an ideal world, we would do a test with 27 and a half bikes as well. Yeah, absolutely. But we just don't have the resources and the manpower to do that. We don't. And the other thing is that there's more movement in the 29er category. There's more new bikes. And what we don't want to do is just repeat the same test that we had last year. And like the 27.5 bike was the Canyon Spectral. We won it two years in a row with two different tire sizes, but the same wheel size. Um, I just didn't see the point in like redoing that mm. test when there wasn't a lot of new bikes on the market to say that that's still an amazing bike and yep. it is still an amazing bike. So next year, we might have a 27 and a half test. If there's a load of new bikes to come out and we want to like, or we might have a 29er Canyon. Yep. Right, we've cleared up a few things there. I think it's now time to get into the meat of the test and introduce each of the bikes. Yeah, and I think the best way for us to do that is to um, do it in reverse order. So then we reveal the our trail bike of the year. So first up, we've got the GT Carbon Sensor Pro. Yeah, I mean, this bike was introduced last year and GT's really moved it forward for 2020. Some of the key changes are, it's like, it's got a wider bar, it's got a shorter stem, it's got a grippier front tire. And it's also up the fork travel from 130 to 140, just to slacken the head angle out of touch on that bike too. And that's a 130 back end 130 on that bike. 130 rear end. And like, key thing for GT is that, I mean, they messed around with lots of different crazy suspension designs and they've gone full, come full circle and gone back to LTS, which is a classic four bar linkage. Yeah, so horse link. Horse link, rocker link, big beefy rocker link for stiffness, yeah. It's got a flip chip on there. Now yep. it's not just on there to tweak the geometry, is it? It's because there's something about this bike that they're trying to yeah, I think, work around. Um, so the Force, which is the longer travel bike, it shares the same frame. So the Force is a 27.5 bike. Um, so they use the flip chip to kind of compensate for the different wheel sizes. 
And while you can get away with that with like a 27.5 plus wheel and then with fatter tires and 29, you can't really, it's not really a big enough change when you flip the chip to go from 29 down to normal 27.5. And that's why I like the BB sky high on this bike. Is that the main problem with that bike, that it's, it's slightly compromised because it has, it's trying to do two things? It is, it's definitely a compromise um, and, it, and it impacts performance because the BB is high. But like GT's done a really good job at mitigating it. So it's got the elite level um, suspension, front and rear. So you've actually got like on the fork, it's got a Fit4 cartridge. So you've got low speed control. So you can, you can definitely like, although the bike's quite got a high BB and your center gravity's high, the fork's got way more support than the basic grip forks. Um, and on the rear shock, you've also got low speed control. So you can get the bike to ride really flat even though it's got a high BB, where normally if you've got a high BB and you've got really open suspension, the bike will like pitch back and forward all the time. So straight line speed on this bike's amazing. Okay. Like the suspension works, it works really good. They've also changed the tune for 2020 on the rear, so it pedals better. The old bike was a little bit wallowy. This bike's tight, it's firm, it's reactive. And it's only really when you get into proper riding where you're really dynamic on the bike, then you sort of, you, you experience the shortcomings. Okay. So uh, a big improvement from last year's model with some of the component specs and stuff, but not quite there as an overall package. No, it definitely needs something to basically get that BB height down, whether that's a different linkage or a different rear end or something. It just need, they just need to take it one step further, basically on the frame. In terms of the spec, um, spec's pretty good value for money. Um, I really like the G2 brakes from SRAM. Um, they've got really solid, firm feel, which is great because this bike's fast in a straight line. Um, having the grip of your front tire made a big difference. They've also got like a VibroCore spank bar for a little bit of vibration damping there. So yeah, they've done a lot to bring, to really move the bike along, but they just need to get that, they just need to get the geometry dialed so that they can overcome the compromise mm -hmm. between the two wheel sizes. I like the groove tube as well for the cable routing, which is kind of best of both worlds, keeps it, it clean. It kind of but... looks internal, it keeps it clean looking, um, super easy to route your cables through. And in fact, the brakes on this bike felt amazing. And one of the reasons could be that no one, it's got a full factory bleed. Yeah. And when the bike was assembled, no one had to like undo it, thread it through the frame and then redo it, maybe not bleed it properly. Yeah. So yeah, it's really cool. Right, next up, we've got a bike with a name that just trips off the tongue. So I'm gonna hand over to Al to remember it. <laughs> it's the Cube Stereo SLC62. Pretty amazing value, this one, isn't it? For a shop-bought bike. Unreal. Yep. Like, I mean, when this turned up, I thought straight away, well, this bike's gonna win the test because it's got like factory level suspension from Fox. It's got a Kashima transfer seat post. It's got XT drivetrain, XT brakes. I mean, there's, it's got top of the range, like Schwalbe tires. It's got absolutely everything you and want. It's a like, full carbon frame, isn't it? Full carbon frame. Yeah, yeah, totally. So if I was to go onto the Cube website, I mean, I would just be overwhelmed with stereos. So which one is this model? This is the 150 mil travel stereo okay. with 29 inch wheels. There's also a 120 mil bike version and a 170 mil version. So basically, oh, not forgetting, there's a 140 mil, 27.5 version too. Okay. So basically the easiest way to think about it is that everything, is, everything that's not XC race or downhill is a stereo. Okay. And then you just pick your travel. So we've yeah. gone in the middle. 150 mil on the rear on this bike, slap bang in the middle with a 160 mil fork. Okay, cool. Uh, and and how, how was it? I mean, it, it looks a million dollars. How did it ride? Not as good as I thought it was going to ride. It's definitely got like, I mean, there's, there's nothing wanting on it. Everything works really well because like it's, it's got really good suspension, it's got really good drivetrain, good wheels, it's a good fit. Like there's nothing wanting on it. Like we said before, the spec's amazing, but it's not quite as modern as some of the other bikes. In fact, it's the shortest, even though it's a 20 inch, which there is, which equates to a large, it's like the shortest bike in test, um, at least in reach. Um, so when you're sat on it, it doesn't kind of have that sort of big open like bombing position that you get on some of the more modern bikes. And also there was a few little things with the suspension, even though you have all the tunability, I couldn't quite get the rear shock to really behave how I wanted it to. When I was climbing, the bike felt a little bit wallowy on the climbs, and that could, be, that could be affected by the seat angle slightly too. And then I thought, well, okay, it's a little bit soft on the climbs. It's kind of built as a kind of trail enduro bike. It's gonna be an absolute pinner on the descents. And then there was a harshness on the descents. So I think really with this bike, I think Cube's done an amazing job with the specification. I mean, they've even color coded the rim decals to the tire. <laughs> 
color to the yeah. to the schwalbe bead yeah. of the color i mean it's 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 insane but i think they need to spend more time on the rear shock because the DPX2 isn't the easiest shock to tune like for the manufacturer and they just need to get it dialed so there's a little bit more support um, but, and also get rid of that kind of initial harshness. Okay. Is that just something that you think uh, a consumer could toy with with volume no. spacers or it's no, a No, I don't think thing? so. I think it's more fundamental than that. And, and, and I'm just guessing that it's the shock. I mean, obviously this is a full carbon frame. It's pretty stiff, it's pretty mm. solid. There might be more to it than, than just the shock tune. And, and, I can, and that's not to say that it's a bad bike in any way. And, in, and if anything, out of all the bikes in this test, it might be one of the, if you're a heavier rider, that stiffness from the frame um, might be a real advantage. But for lighter riders, I just think they'll struggle to get the balance between the suspension response and the chassis stiffness. So it's not the most progressive in terms of geometry and handling either, so. No, but there's nothing, there's nothing that really stands out that's wrong yep. at all. It's, you know, like So that, it's a good safe bet, basically. It is a really good safe bet if you want to have all the best bits with one caveat, um, the XT brakes. I was going to get onto <laughs> that, yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had bikes where I can't get down a trail without like both brakes changing. I have had other bikes that I've actually like swapped hoses in a car park and there's been no problems with them. They're just really, it's really random. Yeah. Um, and even with bleeding, multiple times we've, yeah. we've had issues, haven't we? So I think if you get a set that does it, yeah. you kind of can't get rid of it. Yeah. That's the problem. To sum up then, it's a pretty, it's a pretty slick product, isn't it? But yeah, it's a really slick product. I mean, it looks flash. It's got really good kit on it. It's really good value for money for what you get. It's just not the most progressive in terms of suspension performance or in terms of geometry. Um, but like, if you got this bike, you'd definitely be pleased with it. Right, next up we've got the Scott Genius 920 and this is a bike that in plus bike version actually won the trail bike of the year test a yep. few years ago didn't it yeah totally I mean they've been through all the different kind of wheel sizes and they kind of ended up on this kind of hybrid version which is a 29er with 2.6 inch tires and how does how does that work well they're recon so there's not a lot of tread on them so basically I took those off and put our Maxxis control tires on straight away which was a 2.5 on the front and a 2.4 in the rear so I actually lowered the bottom bracket height by a couple of millimeters and just made the bike feel like kind of snappier and improved traction basic corner traction climbing traction and everything but we should make clear that this bike we ate, we rated it an 8 so it got exactly the same rating as the Cube um, but the two bikes couldn't be more different mm. this bike's got like where the Cube feels stiff and a bit rattly this bike's got some give, some flex, and like it's amazing. Like when we were, when I was testing it, it was wet at the time. It would have amazing like off camber grip and like on routes and like on anywhere where you're kind of like kind of fishing for traction. This bike really finds it. It's really mm. good. Because when they introduced this bike, they had this concept of having this kind of the stiffness backbone, which yeah. is like the down tube, with the chain stays, the lower part of the seat tube, and then yeah, totally, and it really works. And like last year, we had the alloy version of this bike. This year it's got a carbon front end alloy rear. So the carbon front end's about 500 grams lighter than the alloy, um, which is quite a considerable weight saving. And it's stiffer, but it's not, not so mm. stiff that you just think, oh, I'm riding a piece of wood. It feels like they've really managed to get a bit of weight out, put a bit more precision into it, but still retain that flex that allows you to find grip. Like another key weight saving attribute of this bike is they're going with a 34 fork, a little bit spindlier, but this bike's actually got the slackest head angle in test and it needs a 36 mm. or a 35 mil fork from RockShox, whichever way they go with that. Yep. It just, it's just a little bit undergunned up front given how hard you can ride it. Yep. Uh, and obviously this being a Scott, it comes with the twin lock remote system, doesn't it? Yep. Um, and I like, I really liked it. Um, I know there's a, there's a big old web of cables and everything, but like it's a trail bike and um, there is no more efficient way to make it climb better than to increase the compression damping and reduce the spring volume, which is exactly what it does do when you go to traction mm. mode on the rear. I noticed when I was testing it though, that because of the way it also, when you go to traction mode, it also like increases the compression on the fork. That causes the fork to sit up a little more. So that means you sit back a little mm. bit more. So you sink in a little bit more and it would actually be way more effective if they just had it on the rear. So like anyone from Scott's listening to this, can we please just have a single lock? 
Uh, and that's not the only thing they've done with the shock, is it? No, it's got this ramp control on it, so you can have it in the wide open setting. And it's a full travel, so 150 mil on the rear, 150 mil up front. And then like if you're riding bike parks or if you're sending jumps and stuff, because they've got the traction control, they don't have to have a compromise setup. They can have in full travel, they can have it like really open. And that gives you really good like square edge ability. But if you're sending drops and stuff, it can be like a little bit too linear. Mm. So they've got that little ramp switch on there. You just flick it, it closes off a portion of the air can without changing the dampen, mm. so you get more ramp up. So you really can like have your cake and eat it. Right, so we've got this ramp adjust, but they've also inverted the shock, haven't they? Yeah, so the shock's upside down, which absolutely I means the shock's a sealed unit. So it doesn't matter which way around you have it. But what's really neat with what Scott's done, and it's been copied since, is that they put the widest part of the shock at the bottom, near the, near the bottom bracket, which is the wide, wide part of the frame. So that allows them to run their cable from the remote down to the down tube and straight to the shock. So you don't have to have this kind of like coming off the top tube loop. And it also allows for like a really slender upper link here. Some bikes you ride with, without knee pads on, like the link will hit you on the inside of your leg. With this bike, it's just like nothing touches. There's nothing to snag on. But there is a snag. Yeah, there is a snag and it's on the um, quick release rear lever. Um, sorry, you're gonna have to social <laughs> distance. <laughs> it's like, um, just where it, it actually clips the weld at the dropout when you undo it. I mean, obviously it's removable so you can clock it, but it's just slow to do because you have to do it in stages. And I think maybe it was designed for a carbon bike yep. where there was no weld. And then once the weld's there, it just catches. That's it really. Yep. And that's a really cool little tool because you take it out, um, pops out like that. Got a Torx key on there that fits all your pivots. So if your pivots come loose, and we actually had one of the pivots was mm -hmm. loose when we checked it, when we got the bike, um, you can tighten them up on the trail, which is great. So uh, yeah, this is what, about three years old now, this bike, but it's still it's still doing the, the business, isn't it? It is, and like, it's, a, it's just a shame that they're so focused on weight saving, because obviously this is the lightest bike. I think it was 13.2 kilograms. It's, it's the lightest bike in the category. Obviously it needs like some chunkier tires. It needs a chunkier fork. I mean, they've got room to put some weight into this bike and make it more capable mm. without it getting heavy because they're yep. starting off with, like with the lightest bike. Still a great bike to ride. <laughs> I it? loved riding it. Yep. Like it's got a really good, it's really reactive. It's really responsive. And I really like the fact that, like again, I said, I rode these bikes when it was wet and it was muddy. And one thing I really noticed with the traction mode was that when, I'm cl when you're climbing and it's boggy, that kind of thing where you kind of get, get into a soft spot on the climb and the kind of suspension sinks and the whole thing just kind of goes ooh or uh, and grinds to a halt. When you're in traction mode, it's just sitting higher and you just kind of motor through those sections and I just thought that was brilliant. Right, so moving up through the ratings, we've got the white S150. This is another bike that's three years old and it's still at top of the game. Yeah, totally. I mean, white was so far ahead of the curve in terms of like fit and sizing that this bike, you get on it and it just feels like totally contemporary. Like even though it's three years, it's got the second longest reach and test. So I think it's just a little bit shy of what the new proof reactor is. And like, that's the bike that's brand new. Mm. And um, the S was for switch, wasn't it? So you, it yeah. was to you do both wheel sizes, you wasn't change it? Both wheel sizes, they just ditched that. Yeah, so this is the 29 version yeah. and 150 travel. So it's easy to, uh, to understand from the yeah. name, isn't it? Yeah, and in fact, they build this bike as um, trail enduro um, because of that. Um, it's got like, it's got 150 mil travel. It's got 29 inch wheels. It's slack, it's long. It's a bike designed for going fast. And it, it looks like a really chunky bike, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. It's chunky, it's solid. It's not, it's not got a harshness to it though. The, the rear suspension is really supple on it. Um, so it's not like it's, you're getting rattled from the stiffness. And they've done a really good job, I think, of blending like the kind of oversized carbon front end with the alloy rear end. You look at it and it's mm. pretty seamless. Yeah. And they've got the, the big wide pivot at the yeah. back. So they've got, they were one of the pioneers of this single chain ring design. Totally. I mean, they ditched the front, the front derailleur like before most even brands were considering it. It allows them to have like a wider pivot stance and keep like things balanced at the rear. So would you say this is, of all the bikes here, this is the, the most kind of aggressive sort of riding bike or towards that end of the spectrum? Yes and no. It is in terms of your riding position and like the rear suspension feels really like geared towards that. So like it really is good at like hammering through rough stuff. Um, but like 
I actually think they've got the pairing wrong on this bike because they put a pike on it. Um, and although it's got like a 35 mil chassis, it's stiff enough. And in fact, this is one of the few, very few bikes that actually comes with torque caps on the hub. So they're making use of those bigger mm. end caps on the hub to like increase stiffness. So it's not like a stiffness issue, but the pike's just damped to be more like, to have more support and to have like a firmer threshold. So you definitely get like, it sits up really high, which it feels good, but there's a harshness to it that you don't get with maybe like a Lyric or a Yari or any of the forks that are more dedicated towards Enduro. So I actually think there's a little, there's a slight disconnect in the travel and the rear is really, really supple and really sensitive. And the fork sits up nice, so you've got good control. But when you really start charging hard, the one of the big differences I noticed between this bike and the Nuke Proof um, was that the Nuke Proof had better balance. So could you buy a different damper for that fork and get this bike absolutely spot yeah, on? Yeah, I'm pretty certain you can just drop in like a 150 mil like Yari or a Lyric and charger damper in there and get, the, get that sensitivity back. Because it's not an air spring thing, it's totally on the damper. Okay. When I read the test, there's something about this being uh, a V2, is that yep. right? So it's version two. And like, it's no different to version one in terms of the frame, um, but it just allows white to make some subtle changes to the specification as different parts become available. Like this bike, this version two one has a bike yoke dropper. Um, so it's got 160 mil drop instead of 150, which was on previous on the version one, which was a different dropper post. Um, and what I really like about this bike yoke is that white's got this internal clean, super clean, like um, integrated, clamp, yeah. the integrated clamp. But if you overdo it, um, it can really inhibit your like dropper post going up and down. And if you underdo it, you go into a corner and the seat hits your inside your leg and then you come out the corner and the seat's pointing in the wrong way. With this, I was able to get it tight enough so that the seat didn't move, but the dropper post st still felt really free. And it's got like one of the best levers, underbar levers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a really great addition. And it's got like a fast rolling rear, grippy front kind yeah. of combo, yeah, combo. on the tires. Yeah. That works, that works really well, I think, as a trail bike. Obviously the aggressor rear tire, it steps out a little bit more, it steps out a little bit more suddenly than, than, than some of the tires I'm used to. So, uh, so yeah, the white S150, that got a nine, didn't it? Got a nine. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a, like for a three-year-old bike, it's amazing. Um, it rides really good, you feel really confident on it. You can really charge hard. I just think when it gets really rough, you just want, I want a slightly higher level of performance out of the fork but the bike was also one of the cheapest bikes in test. Um, so you've got money to play with if you want to drop that, upgrade the charger cartridge in the fork. So that only leaves one bike then? Yeah, the winner. Yep. So last, but by no means least, we have the winner of the 2020 Trail Bike of the Year test, and it's the Nuke Proof Reactor. So I remember riding this bike at the launch in Italy in the Italian Dolomites, and the first run I did was down a just savagely rocky, rough trail. I got to the bottom, I went to the guys from Nuke Proof and I said, you've totally nailed this bike. Yeah. And yeah. It, is, it is amazing, isn't it? it? Totally, it is. I mean, and they've really nailed the suspension. So what they've done is they've made it like a little bit more regressive at the beginning. So it kind of goes into its travel quite easily. And then from sag, it gets progressive. You're sort of in this kind of floaty little window of like really sensitive travel. And I actually thought, while I thought that was really good, I thought, oh yeah, you'll see when you start to pedal or sprint or climb, it's going to feel wallowy and it doesn't. Yeah. And that's what's really impressive about it. So you've got this super sensitive feel, um, but you've also got support for pushing in corners. You've got support for sprinting or when you're climbing, you just sit on the saddle and twiddle away. And like, it's not like, I mean, it's got the, the compression lever on here on the shock, on the DPX2 shock, but I wasn't using it at all when I was testing mm. the bike. Let's go back to basics though. So what, what travel is this model? This has got 130 on the rear, 140 on the front. And there's also a 27.5 version of this bike. Um, so for anyone that wants a 27.5 bike, this is available in 27.5. And it's got 10 mil more travel front and rear. So 140, 150. And we've measured these bikes, haven't we, anyway? So yep. all the geometry is on the website. All the reviews are on the website, mbr.co.uk. So if you want to find out any of the geeky details, check it out. And if we've got any of the geeky details wrong in this video, <laughs> <laughs> the correct stuff's all on the website. So this is a full carbon frame, is it? 
Yeah. I it's think a, the alloy bikes even have carbon stays, I think, don't they? The alloy bike has a carbon seat stay assembly. Yeah. Yeah, so that keeps like the unsprung mass down. It keeps the suspension really reactive. Um, yeah, it's a really cool feature that it's on all the models. And so there's also a more affordable versions of this yeah, as well down the, the line. Yeah, totally. So this is, it's, a, it's a very contemporary bike. I and mean, it's only launched last year. So that means that it should be the most progressive as well. Is that yeah, right? It has. I mean, it's got the longest reach measurement. Hasn't got the slackest head angle, but it's slack enough. And it's got a geometry chip here right on the seat stay assembly what's really cool about it is you can undo it it doesn't take seconds like you got, you to, it's a little bit fiddly but you can undo it without taking the hardware out so you mm. don't like lose bits on the floor like we're here today um, and then just flip them around drop it in change the geometry so i've currently got it set in the low setting which i like because it slackens it a touch and keeps your pedals really like low to the ground but if you're riding rockier terrain where mm. you need that pedal clearance especially for climbing and stuff you could just flip that yeah, at the start of a ride, even if yeah. you wanted to, it is, it's really it's a usable forward. feature, totally isn't it? Usable, yeah, yes. And we've got a nice steep seat angle on yep. the actual seat angle as well, haven't yep. we? So you're sat forward, and you can do you can have that because you've got the longer reach measurement. So you're kind of like you've mm. still got even when you're sat forward pedaling, you still have space in the cockpit to have a nice natural riding position. And new proof have gone with a chunky 36 fork, which is which is good to see as yep. well, isn't it? And like it's it's really good. Like this is the basic. 36 so it doesn't have like the low speed compression adjustment and stuff like that so it's quite an open fork so it's really critical that you get the air pressure right on the fork because you're getting your support from the spring not the damper but because you've got that rear suspension that's got that super supple little pocket the balance is really good front and rear they're both really sensitive so we've done a great job with the suspension geometry is really good is there anything else about this bike that really sort of stands out it's got xo plus case in tires so like that's like pretty much like a massive bonus on this bike. So the, it's one of the reasons why it's not one of the lightest bikes in the test, but you want to be riding trails hard and then be tweaking your suspension, thinking about what you're doing, not stopping fixing punctures all the time. The specification, there's some highlights from like, obviously this new proof, there's a Sam Hill signature grip. They feel really good on there. There's an interesting feel to this bike as well, because bar, stem and front end feel really solid. Like one thing I noticed when I was riding, you could be really precise, you could be really precise with it in rough terrain. Um, but the bike's not got that stiffness the whole way through it. You've got precision without deflection. Mm. And I really, like, I really mm. like that trait of this bike. And I also really like the fact that it's low slung because you could really chuck it around. It's a really fun, mm. like poppy, agile, playful bike. And I think they've done a really good job of not making it a short traveled enduro bike. Yeah. Because there's a lot of bikes like that, that you just go, well, once you've got a 63 or a 64 degree head angle and you've got like certain, certain parameters, well, you may as well just have more travel to go mm. with them. And um, this bike, I think it's, it's a really good trail bike. It's equally at home around here in the Surrey Hills or in the UK. It feels, it feels like the perfect tool for these sort of trails, yeah. but then you can also take it to somewhere more extreme like the Alps. Totally. And it's not out of its depth. No, you can ride it hard in every situation. And um, that's what you want from a trail bike. Yeah. Vers versatility is really what's key. Like, you know, like if you have a short travel bike that's more kind of race focused, you're going to make compromises for when you go somewhere that's rougher. If you have an enduro bike, then you want to be riding more sort of downhill style trails and uh, maybe where you're pedaling up fire roads. This bike's kind of good everywhere. So what size did we use for the test? So this is a large. I'm 5'11", and like this is absolutely the perfect fit for me. But the jump to XL is actually quite big. Um, so I think maybe for like 6'2 plus, would, you'd be on an XL. The difference between the reach grows as a you lot. go up the size yeah, range, grows, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not just like 20 mil every, every size. Yeah. yeah. So the launch, um, I remember them talking to me about the fact they wanted to keep maintenance to a minimum on this bike. How do yeah. they do that? Yeah, so the pivots, um, the suspension pivots have got enduro bearings in it. Um, so like hopefully they're going to last and if you know like and you're not going to be changing them every like six weeks when it's raining um, there's also a threaded bb in there so like that's a sh bike shop mechanics favorite mm. easy to get out easy to get in and this one's a full shimano drivetrain and, and brakes how was how are they yeah the, the drivetrain works a treat actually um, in fact compared to the cube you couldn't tell the difference when you're when you're pedaling slx or pedaling xt you can tell the difference in the brakes however because we had no issues with the SLX brakes on this bike. I don't know if that's just chance or if other people have SLX brakes with intermittent bike point, um, but the ones on this bike work perfectly. So the Reactor, a worthy winner for 2020, I'd say then. Yeah, it didn't take too long for me to establish that this was the best bike. Yeah, yeah. The other bikes are good, but they've got everything right. And they also have the advantage of being the newest bike. Yep. 
So there we have our 2020 Trail Bike of the Year winner. It's the Nuke Proof Reactor 290C Elite. We hope you enjoyed this video. Let us know in the comments below what you thought and we'll catch you next year.